So, um, welcome everyone to the 2018 uh, webinar series. This is a bit of a, a training session for Heather, but uh, I've been about doing a webinar series from all of you and so we're already got uh, the next couple lined up. Obviously today we're here to talk about ANOVA and their fundraise and thank you so much ANOVA for even suggesting this. It's, it's tipped us into something which I hope is going to be really great. And um, in two weeks time I'm capitalising on the fact that uh, Karina, which is another group I volunteer for, is having uh, our AGM and we have a guest speaker, Andrew Stock, who is part of the Climate Council and writes a lot of their energy stuff. He's formerly um, from Origin Energy. He'll be talking to us about changing the politics of climate and energy. I've almost got Mephil over the line to talk about their Spark conference they, they held last week. So we're looking forward to hearing about those highlights. And there's plenty of others coming up. So please um, keep tuned in. So welcome today. Um, Alison Crook is the chair of ANOVA and ANOVA is Australia's first community owned electricity retailer. So we're really excited to be talking to Alison today. We were going to have Tony. Tony's been sent home sick and Felicity, well done Felicity, has uh, stepped up to join us and um, I'm your host, uh, Heather Smith. I'm currently chairing the Coalition for Community Energy and we're in the midst of a transition between the informal group that C4CE was to a proper formal structure under the Embark um, uh, official structure. And so that's taking up a lot of our time, but we're really hoping that by the end of this year, we'll get some of the knowledge flows for the Coalition for Community Energy working a lot better. And um, because that's what uh, community Energy has been really great at so far is, is sharing uh, knowledge. So to give you uh, a little background uh, and about why I'm excited about uh, talking to ANOVA, I love telling ANOVA's story and I tell people that ANOVA came to, they weren't ANOVA then, came to the very first uh, Congress in um, 2014 and went home to the Northern Rivers to build a solar power station or something like that. But everyone they talked to said, but we can build that. We can do that. We need a friendly retailer to deal with. And of course, creating your own electricity uh, retailer is not the easiest task in the world. And I'm so impressed that um, ANOVA have managed to do this. And let's go straight to hearing from them. First of all, I want to uh, congratulate you all on sending in your end of um, uh, Alison and Felicity's presentation. They're going to start answering a lot of these questions if they haven't done it in the presentation. And you have a Q&A panel. If you look down at your controls, you can ask questions. Um, you can also put it in uh, the chat. Uh, but uh, we would rather have it in the Q&A and we will try to manage both a verbal questioning and some written written stuff. When we publish this, we're publishing this as a recording and hopefully we can publish all the questions and answers as well, which I'm sure people will be um, excited about. So welcome Alison and, uh, and Felicity and I'm going to keep controlling the slides. So Alison's just going to tell me, oops, when to press down. Okay. So um, over to you. Okay, I think you can press down. <laughs> <laughs> as, as Heather has already told you, uh, Innova Community Energy is Australia's first community owned energy retailer. And we came into being really in response to the push from our own community in the region to do something about climate change in the face of government inaction. And I, everybody, I hear everybody scream, well, what's changed? Um, so, yes, we're still trying to do something practical and to give everybody an avenue for doing something practical in the face of government inaction. 
The final trigger in our case was the uh, attempt to, to start coal seam gas mining in the Bentley area, which is just west uh, to the west of Lismore in the Northern Rivers. And the community managed to see that off. Uh, the protectors, I was one of them, all got together and we managed to see off the attempt to do gas seam mining. The, the, the uh, New South Wales government withdrew the uh, mining leases. Uh, but while we were doing that, what we realised was it's not enough to say no, we have to show that an alternative is possible. And so that's why, um, and one of the, the, the final triggers for saying yes, let's do something. The, we went, as, as Heather has said, to the uh, Coalition for Community Energies conference and came back thinking, oh yes, power station. And, and as Heather has said, no, the gap was really, um, Obviously, everybody wanted to do locally owned and controlled models of generation, but the gap was that we needed that community retailer. So um, we did the feasibility study, spent 2015 doing the business plan, doing getting the retail license, um, getting the prospectus written and approved by ASIC, uh, and then the last four months of uh, 2015, doing our first capital raise. But we decided to set it up, and I think it's important for people to remember that we set it up from the outset as a social, social enterprise with two goals for, you know, communities. Press down, thanks. Heather? Yeah. So uh, that's fundamentally, we're not your standard business. And it is, um, it's concerning when people think of us as just another corporate, because we aren't. We're community owned and we have social uh, goals. We have to be in profit, obviously, as a social enterprise to be able to deliver on those goals, um, but, but they're the goals. Okay, so as I've said there, you can see the story. We had to do uh, 30, more than 30, I think you might be interested in the first capital raise, the process. Um, that was a standard capital raise. It wasn't possible to do a crowdfunding in those days for equity. In fact, that's something that's only become available this year under, under law to do an equity crowdfund. Um, so we did it all through lodging the prospectus and doing the capital raise with over 30 events around the region and trying to get the word out. And we wound up with over, with that 1,100 investors and 73% from the region and 4 million raised. So the first six months of the year was really doing the hard yards um, with our then CEO, Steve, who'd come out of Origin Energy um, and who knew exactly what had to happen. Um, setting that up, setting up the systems, recruiting the staff, training the staff. Uh, I think it should never be underestimated what is involved in running a retailer. It's a high risk business. Um, and it's a highly regulated business and it's not for the faint-hearted and that's why we say there's no need to have more than one of them around the place as community owned. We're there for everybody um, to be your retailer and we want you to own us um, to be your retailer and help you do your generation. So we set up in June 2016 and by July 2018 we have our 5,000 customers which was the target that we set in our first prospectus. Just to give you some background, the way we set up that structure of the social enterprise is that uh, you can all see there the um, holding company is where the shareholders sit and the board sits and it, then the organisation has those two parts of the retail arm and the not-for-profit arm, you know, the community. Uh, and when we are in profit, 50% um, of profits go back to that not-for-profit arm to be, to be returned to the communities which have supported us through being customers. So, okay, how do we benefit the community? I think there's a, a, a and, and this is the possibility to benefit any community when you think about it, but it was how we set it up to benefit initially the Northern Rivers. It's, we retain operating expenses and profits and over time energy production as we get more and more generation going in the region. Um, and at the moment, or when we first started, there was well over 300 million leaving the region. Um, and that's with 130,000 households. So if you think about any region, your region, and it's money that could be circulating in your region and helping it do whatever it wants to do. We create direct and indirect employment. And because we're majority owned, then you've got the majority returns to the community. And 
as I've said, half of those returns will go to social benefit projects to make sure that everybody can participate in the shift to renewables. That was one of our big, um, the big things that we were thinking about when we set up, that we, we realised that it's so easy for people who can't afford solar um, or people who can't have solar uh, to be left behind in the shift to renewables. And that's the last thing we wanted to see happen. So that's part of the whole point of being a social enterprise, that we can use those funds to make sure that everybody can participate, the whole community can participate, and we don't get that split uh, going on. We reduce carbon emissions, um, obviously by focusing on the sale of renewable energy, which has been a big driver for us, um, and by offering the best feed-in tariff um, that's been available. Uh, and that, of course, encourages more people to, to put a solar on. Uh, one of the biggest groups that recommend us in the community are the solar installers. Um, and that's, that's all, it's a, it's a virtuous circle, if you like. Uh, and, and if I can just chime in there, uh, yeah. Alison, we did a similar exercise with your help um, down in uh, the southern hills and coasts, south of Adelaide. And we worked out, it was about half the size, about 100, well, about $200 million used to be spent on energy. Yep. And just the rooftop solar alone was saving that community $50 million a year. Yep. So it, it is significant if we, if we can get that into the community. I'll butt back out and let you get... No, that's all right. <laughs> please, please, please interrupt any time. And I think the point is that we now purchase 60% of our energy from those very rooftops, from, from the rooftops in our region. So you can see just how much is staying, funds staying in the region that was, was previously leaving. So our vision all along has been that we wanted to um, have, see that regional systems could be self-sufficient. That's, that's the bottom line, that we want to move towards a model in which is decentralised, distributed, digital and democratic. I mean, it's, people have said it before, but I think it's worth repeating, where communities power themselves. And that goes for cities as well. I mean, you can do it in suburbs, you can do it in sections of cities. Um, and we can do it because our licence allows us to, to operate right across the national electricity market. Now, Victoria is currently not in that, but um, we, um, we're certainly ready to partner with anybody in Victoria to go down that path. And our back office systems are scalable, as, as the slide says. But I think very importantly, we're willing to shape relationships or partnerships with any one size fits all model. We're happy to talk about well, what works for you. Um, so with one group at the moment, we're talking about white labelling. Um, and that's the sort of thing we can do. Um, but it may be that you simply want to say, well, we'll bring customers to you and then we'll give you, you know, you'll take a certain proportion of the, of the, of the profits back to make sure that you can carry out the, your projects. So that's, that's the sort of vision. Um, just talking quickly about how that, that model operates. Obviously, we go from what we all have now, and we know it's that big centralised model um, with big companies owning fossil fuels and with a plan to shift so that they're still owning the renewables when, it, when they finish, when we all finish the transition. Big companies, transmission, distribution, customer. Energy flows in, money flows out to the model that we are, I think we're all well aware of that 21st century model where communities and consumers participate, own, operate, manage, and everybody benefits, but we're reducing emissions. So that's the, the view that we think we can shift towards. Next one, thanks. And just to spell it out in words, we see that there's that partnership to be developed um, between the um, producer, consumer, uh, that horrible word, prosumer, uh, the retailer and the network, um, with additional storage, some of it will be managed by networks, but some of it will be managed um, simply with smart technology. Um, and being able to manage network peaks better, um, street batteries or household batteries, but potentially so you've got the, the options of um, virtual power plants, but you can also look at things that operate with, with street batteries or uh, the like, and microgrids and embedded networks. Um, we're just putting in our first pilot microgrid at the moment. Uh, and having geographic communities that can be largely independent or you, drawing as little as possible from those long distance transmission lines where energy is lost. And then the consumers sharing in the savings. Thanks, Helen. Next. 
So where we're up to now is that we really want to shift to the next phase of making it possible for more communities to own part of us and for more communities to participate in that, in that vision. But to do that, um, we really need uh, to, to, to get additional capital. So um, our key strategies that we want to implement, uh, that we want to uh, be able to purchase power at a better price so that we can be, offer a more competitive offering and offer to bigger customers as well, make it possible for bigger, bigger players to, to participate. But to do that, we need more capital backing. Um, and of course, I think everybody who's watching this will, will realise why the wholesale prices are so high at the moment, which is as well as the retail, and they've capitalised on um, the, the uh, short-term problems that occurred with the closure of the Victorian coal, coal brown coal mine um, to double the wholesale prices. And then they've left it happily sitting up there, although their generation costs aren't anymore. So we need to be able to find um, cheaper, a cheaper source of energy. We want to form it with a renewable, uh, to, to buy either a renewable power purchase agreement or um, to be able to um, move towards um, a partnership with a generator or to own some generation. But all of that uh, is one of the strategies for which we need more capital. We obviously also want to grow the customer numbers. We want to move into Sydney, Newcastle, Wollongong um, by the end of this year. We want to move into Queensland by the beginning of next year. Uh, and we're happy to go wherever we're invited apart from that. Um, but to do that, obviously, again, we need the capital to make that possible and to do to form those partnerships. And, uh, and we need to be partnering with a range of technology companies. And there's a lot of fabulous technology companies in Australia with the sort of technology that we need to do the embedded networks um, and um, to do the likes of the virtual power plants and so on. But again, we, we need to have capital to, to do that um, alteration of systems that's required um, and to do the partnerships effectively. So overall, it's really a case of we want that increased engagement with more communities. And in particular, we want to make it possible for more people in those communities to participate. You'll recall that when we first went to the market, our shares were $1,000 and people were sharing shares. And people were saying to us, you know, we'd really love to participate, but you know, $1,000 is a bit of an ask. So that's why now that equity crowdsource funding is legal, um, we've said, let's make the shares a dollar. And the minimum subscription is $100. So that's essentially um, what, what we're doing. And you'll see with the next slide that we've got our crowdfunding website, Crowd88, um, and it's possible to go on there and work your way through um, a fairly complex website and, uh, and uh, purchase $100 worth of shares. Next slide. So I guess the question that I'd like to, to put to you is, well, we would love your communities, or we'd love to have all of the communities that are involved in Coalition for Community Energy involved, to get involved in owning um, some of Innova. Uh, and we'd love you to take on publicising it so that your community does own some of Innova. And I guess the reason, I suppose, the benefits is that um, not, not only through the not-for-profit arm do 50% of to use within that community, but it's a chance on the other side, the bit that goes to investors for, for, the, for the other 50% um, means that when there are dividends, you get the return to the community investors. So it's also obviously then a way in which in your region, it's easier to facilitate community generation. And you've got that double, double benefit, as, as I've said, that you get being through both through owning community generation and owning your own retailer. So I guess the other point that I, I've tried, tried to make throughout this is that it's helping to drive the system change towards that 21st century decentralised model. So in, in summary, I guess I'd say, you know, we, it's within our grasp to have a renewable future um, generated as locally as possible, minimising waste, minimising costs. And, uh, so why not join in over, become part of the solution? 
and that's the risk warning that we always have to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got our disclaimer out there. We now have. um let's let's go straight to questions. We've got a couple streaming through already. So in top on top of the ones that um I'm gonna leave here on the screen so that we can all see them. Alison, I'll I'll read out um the, the new ones. Uh David asks, are you looking at aggregating residential demand and buying power through a PPA? And um, he also asked what role could local governments uh, in Victoria play? So uh, where would you like to start, uh, Alison? Go for it. <laughs> and Felicity. Well, I think I'll let Felicity have a go. She's been very, sure. very quiet. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Heather. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm the operations manager here at Inova and have been here for around um, eight months. And um, it's fantastic working for in over an organisation that really is a community um, social enterprise and has a, a for-profit as well as a for-purpose model. Um, so it's a wonderful organisation to be a part of and obviously just um, building on what Alison has said, you know, we're really looking to move to the next phase of our growth now so that we can actually um, start to realise a lot of the goals and objectives of ANOVA in terms of driving um, long-term um, energy change and really being part of a solution. So we're a, a disruptor in the market, but a, a positive disruptor um, on the energy, energy front. Um, in terms of, I'm just looking at the questions here that have been top. asked. Sure. So why, why $100 shares? Um, so I guess as, as Alison has, has mentioned as well, um, previously for the first capital raise, shares were $1,000 per share and sometimes several people were gathering together and purchasing one share between them. So for this, um, it was decided to, um, to have shares as a um, dollar a share with a minimum of 100 shares um, as a purchase um, tranche. So we are really looking and for smaller investors and more, more of those. And I noticed um, you've uh, got $600,000 raised so far. Is that what I saw on that, no, that no, grab from? Sorry, Heather. Yeah, uh, 600000 is the minimum subscription that we have. That's the target. The, the, the picture that you saw was just the very first um, slide and it was before we even started capital raising. So we're close to right. halfway on that at the moment. Half, but we Fantastic. Raise Three million. Yeah, if we can, but six hundred thousand is the minimum. Yeah. So our and, and of course to follow that um, that story, we've just seen DC Power come out with a fundraise as well, and they had fifty dollars shares and raised seven and a half million dollars. So obviously, you're hoping that you get a similar sort of promotional um, dividend and and the fact that there's less at risk uh, with the hundred dollars here. Yeah, I'd just, yes. I'd just say that I think, to the best of my knowledge, the $7.5 million was not through the crowdfund. Um, oh, okay, interesting. So to be not, it, it would be a good question for us to ask um, them at some stage. They've yes. Um, yes. shown a bit of interest in doing a webinar as well, everybody, in case, in case uh, you want to hear from DC Power. Let's, let's hope we pull that off. Yes. So, yes. Um, yes. Oh. Oh, I just I'm, re I'm really interested in this next question about what shareholders get because um, I, I know that uh, you have to be selective about which regions you enter. Uh, will, will this give you much more freedom to enter regions with fewer customers signing up or, or do you still have a bit of a minimum bar that you need to hurdle before you can make a real push into a region? No, we can be, we're accessible in any region for customers. There's no, there's no bar at all, apart from Victoria where our licence doesn't go. Um, well, at the moment we're only in New South Wales, in country New South Wales, but I mean our, our licence allows us to go into any region. Um, the bar is um, more, would we um, be able to purchase energy from a generator in that region? as to, to how many customers, because you'd need to be able to sell the energy back. But I think we're looking at new models anyway, and we're certainly saying we can merchant energy from a retailer. So, Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's more, um, I guess what shareholders get from where we sit is that when we're in profit, um, and we aren't there yet, um, 
then shareholders will get a dividend. So half of the would go to dividends and the other half would go back to through the not-for-profit arm to the communities from which they came. So, yes, there's no particular barrier about numbers of customers, but obviously we're going to go, um, we have to, for each place we go, we have to enter into agreements with the um, distributor, and, and Felicity might like to comment on that. Um, so separate agreements with each distributor, a bit of work. Um, and then apart from that, um, once they're in place and setting up um, Obviously, that then drives the pricing structure as well. So, a new pricing structure to be derived and new marketing to be done, um, potentially. Um, that's the sort of hold up. So, you'd want to have a certain number of people in a state or in a, re a distribution region, but that's the only barrier. Sure, and just to, to add to Alison's comments, um, we're obviously we have our um, energy retail license accredited through the Australian Energy Regulator. Um, and are abiding by all of the rules and regulations that the AER sets, as well as the Australian Energy Market Operator. Um, so the energy industry is a highly regulated um, industry, and it's, it, it is that way to protect um, customers and consumers, and especially um, low income or customers in hardship um, and in energy poverty. Um, so. There's a, there are a lot of regulations at the federal level and also at the state level as well. And as Alison mentioned, um, there's network um, distribution agreements that also are put in place as well as our marketing and sales um, acquisition channels and all of our customer service um, requirements as well to fulfil. So we can um, and are set and um, poised to, to move into other markets. All of our systems um, and team are, um, are ready to, to launch into other areas. It's just... We're looking at the timing of when we move into other markets, but as Alison said, we're looking to move to, to Sydney, Newcastle and Wollongong um, beyond the what's the essential energy network now, um, which is really the country, um, New South Wales area. So, so yes, stay tuned for us moving into, into other areas. I see it's one of the, the questions as well. Yeah. That's great. And you've been... Um working with a number of regions about what it looks like when you get to those regions and how those regions benefit. What, what are the discussions that you've had that um, help you understand what it looks like when you land in South Australia or Victoria, uh, well, let's, let's leave Victoria on hold for a moment, in Queensland, say, or in Newcastle? What, what additional stuff do you feel you need to do to really create a presence there and, and deliver back that community benefit? It's, it's really a case of hopefully being able to engage with the community um, groups there to help get the message out because we don't that we, we don't have a big marketing budget. So uh, we need to work with people who are committed to seeing a different approach. Um, being carried out in their community. So that's that's one of the, the keys, you know, how, how can we set up a relationship with community energy groups to, um, to work together? Absolutely. We, we're quite unique in that um, a lot of our customer acquisition comes through um, happy customers referring their friends and family and businesses to us, um, as well as solar installers and other partnerships that we have. But we have a lot of strong uh, existing community relationships in our local Northern Rivers community and beyond from um, the work that a lot of our team, including Alison, has been doing to, to bring ANOVA um, out to the regions as well. So it is really something that we do um, take pride in and um, I think do well, particularly in the Northern Rivers region, is really developing long-term strong strategic partnerships with community organisations and really looking at what are the benefits that we can bring um, to communities as well, so and community organisations. Um, we have our energy coaches as well that offer um, free energy audits to low-income homes um, to really help look at how people are using energy in their homes, particularly if they're in energy poverty um, or struggling to pay their bills, then we actually look at helping them manage their bills and their energy usage and reduce their energy consumption so that they're better prepared for, for everything in general. Um, so we offer that to, to low-income homes currently as well. Yeah. 
And that, that just reminds me and of the point that I didn't make in when, when, when we were going through about how you lower carbon emissions and it goes to one of the questions that's asked further down, um, which is, um, I think it was something to do with, with um, the whole, yes, energy efficiency is a highly cost-effective way not only to save money, but promotes better health outcomes and improves quality of life. How do we make this part of a holistic approach to the way we assist households? I think, you know, it's fair to say we would be the only energy company around that's set out with a goal to help people use, it, use less energy. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we very, very um, firm on the, the view that the best, the best uh, energy kilowatt is the one you don't use. So the niggle watch yeah, um, absolutely. Is, is, is the one to go and, for. And, the, and, and, and a lot of people in the energy efficiency game call it the never ending marathon because, <laughs> you know, we've been de delivering government programs for, for eons and it probably talks a little bit to David's question about what role could local governments play. And at the moment, your energy coaches are volunteers. Um, ultimately, when you make a profit, you'll be able to feed, keep keep the funding, have some funding level for that um, public good, public yes. benefit that you're delivering. But um, efficiency is a useful thing to support in their region, can't they? Exactly. And, and furthermore, I think what, what we would propose is, is working with bodies such as that um, to come up with the models that they think work best for them. But, but we're happy to make our IP, you know, throw our, our, our IP into the pot. You know, we've worked with Urala Znet, we've worked with the Bellingen and Coffs Harbour people out of our region. And it's a case of saying, well, you know, this is what, this is the way they'd like to tackle it. Here's some ideas we have. And I, I think it's a case of, and we know there's heaps of other people working in this field out there. It's working together to come up with things that work for each community. Yes, and Urala have a, a big group of volunteers, don't they, um, yes, they driving do. their program. Is yeah. Bellingen the same? No, they have their own group. So, Bellingen so that makes Bellingen. it a huge, huge idea. Da David's come back. Um, local government in Victoria are looking at becoming retailers. Uh, do you have any comments on um, that, whether, how local government can play that? And, and maybe we should talk about South Australia because um, we've worked with six uh, local governments here and their view was that they had no interest in becoming retailers, but they were quite interested in your white label um, options. So um, maybe you could uh, expand on that. Yes, um, both here and, and elsewhere in, in New South Wales, we're currently looking at, I mean, both in the, the, the possibility that you mentioned in South Australia and also in elsewhere in New South Wales, we are talking about a white labelling option. And I've certainly had some initial discussions with a group of um, Victorian councils as well. Um, because it, the whole point about retailing is the complexity um, and the skills, the skill set, which is very particular um, in terms of uh, risk management, uh, in terms of compliance, is a very, very particular skill set. and. Um, wherever we've explained that in detail to people, they see that it's not something they actually want to run on their own, but they can be the front end. They can take on a lot of the marketing and sales over time with training. So it's a, it's a movable um, it's a movable feast. You, you might start off with with most of it being delivered, but with all of the packaging and the front end and and um, actual out in the market marketing at the at the uh, council end or whatever, but progressively it might be that you then wish to take on more of the, the actual face-to-face -face staff end that's involved in the marketing. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to recreate the software systems that have to handle it, but to share those costs means there's more benefits for everybody. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to share the, the, um, the risk management approaches. It doesn't make a lot of sense very small retailer, you can't get a power purchase agreement at a decent price and you can't buy a hedge at a decent price. So all of those things are... So let's have a chat about that. It's the top question. How can an, emergency, an emerging community-focused retailer compete on price with the big three? With great difficulty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and it's something that we're working on very hard at the moment. Um, so we have a number of options that we're exploring um, from um, 
from PPAs and trying to work with getting good offers from renewable retailers. Um, difficult without good capital behind you, um, but you know you can work towards it. The sort of thing that we're investigating is, and that I actually put to Josh Frydenberg on the night before, <laughs> the night before he ceased being the Minister for Energy. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to get a meeting with him the day before um, and uh, it was the suggestion that, you know, government could stand behind all small retailers under a certain size to say, well, you know, if you actually, you know, we will guarantee your PPA or we'll guarantee your whatever, um, if, um, so, to, so that if you fell over, then a government agency could pick up that and use that energy. Um, and, he said, well, you know, it's sort of now it's not quite the time or place to be discussing this. <laughs> but, but why don't you... Yeah, no, I'd like... Why don't you go to the I'd New like South to Wales... i pick up on that. Hmm. So, so, yeah. so, so, so we tried to get into the New South Wales Minister there. Sorry, I'm so, um, the, other, the other part of that... This yeah. idea of someone big sitting behind you is, is partly what sits behind the community banking model. And, exactly. um, and when we looked at the resilient hills and coasts, I, I you know, trawled across a lot of governance stuff because I was quite worried that um, in South Australia, we have a lot of voltage issues down at the very local levels because we have such high penetration of, uh, of rooftop solar. And some of those could be solved uh, by putting in a community battery. And yeah. uh, although the push seems to be to individual batteries, suddenly you get into this idea of collective assets and community assets. Exactly. And, and, and you need a fallback. You need, right. if, if Bendigo Bank um, has a successful community banking model, partly because they sit there as the fallback and the big person behind um, the, the local bank, and, and yes, let's say community banking, they would actually wind it up and, and take it away if, if, uh, but if the local bank fell over. I, I think there's real merit in, in the model that someone bigger sits behind um, smaller community focused companies. Yes, yes, we, we, think, we think there is room for that. Um, or an arena or, you know, just who it is that we, we do it with. We're also looking at setting up potentially um, an asset owning subsidiary that people can invest in. So that, that would look to doing things like potentially having storage. Um, so there's a range, a whole range of things that we're exploring, um, but it's just trying to make sure that we, we, um, we need capital to do quite a number of them. Um, and we're, we're looking to have meetings with other people on, on others of those fronts. It's worth noting, I think that the New York Power Authority model, which was suggested to us by Audrey Zimmerman, that um, it's New York um, Power Agency actually owns a whole lot of hydro and they have what they call, um, it's a special sort of, they have a term for it anyway, but they make their power, a, a tranche of power available at a special low rate to all small community retailers. So that they are in a position mm. to offer good rates to uh, low income people and keep prices down and be competitive. Um, are so they a government body? The, yes, yes. Oh, I see. That's very interesting. Now, I'd like us to, to move on to these second two questions and I think they're interlinked. So we had, how does ANOVA's model differ from Energy Locals? And we've also got, how is your business structured and what controls are in place to ensure transparency and accountability? Right. Okay, I'll, I'll take the first one and I'll let, sure. I'll let um, Felicity have a go at the next one. Um, our model is totally different from Energy Locals. I think that should be said right up front. We are the only community-owned energy retailer. We're the only one that has the community actually having the shares and being there to benefit, and that's with half of the income and the other half going back to, the, to all the communities from whom, from whom the consumers come. So we're the only ones that are there with those um, social objectives and that are set up to do that. I think the, the point to bear in mind is that it's um, while we often hear that energy locals are there to share and to assist um, community generation, they are owned at this point now by um, the British super funds um, through who happen to control Cape Byron. Um, 
power. So that's that's majority owned by the British super funds. So if you're talking about wanting your money to stay local and circulate in the community, we're saying our 50% of profits when we're in profit will go back to the communities that we hope will own us from all around Australia. Um, their 50% will go offshore. I think that's a difference. Yes, and uh, I think it's also important to point out that your shares are structured so that um, nobody could buy you out, really, unless voting, yeah. even major shareholders only get one five vote. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, up to five votes. Yes, and, and now that we're going to um, the model where there will be hundreds of shares rather than single a single share for a thousand dollars it'll be you have to have five thousand um five thousand shares sorry one thousand shares for a vote so that the people who had one share aren't sort of disenfranchised there but but it's still no more than five votes so it doesn't matter how many votes how many shares you own how many how many um yeah how many shares you own you will only ever get five votes so we can't be bought out so in but terms that's of the democratic moderating force in, in your constitution. Um, Felicity, tell us a bit sure. about uh, transparency and accountability. Sure, sure. Um, so I guess in terms of just to start with how the business is structured, we, um, we have two main parts to our business, Anova Energy, which is the retail electricity arm where we sell energy plans to consumers and to small businesses as well. And we have Anova Community, our not-for-profit arm. Um, in the energy retailing side of the business and over energy. Um, it's structured reasonably typically compared to some of the other retailers um, in that we have a, a call centre that handles our inbound and outbound sales calls uh, as well as our customer service inquiries. Um, we have our finance team, um, our back of house team that's really the engine room of the business managing market transactions and billing. Um, and we have a marketing department as well um, and also a sales team um, that are in field as well as in our call centre. So it's, it's, a, it's a reasonably typical structure in terms of how we ensure transparency and accountability. There's a number of measures um, in place. Um, firstly, as an energy retailer, we are governed by um, the AER, the Australian Energy Regulator, um, the Australian Energy Market Operator, also the, the rules set by the ACCC um, in terms of um, engaging with consumers and um, yes, any con kind of consumer engagement we're guided by ACCC um, requirements. And there's also specific New South Wales requirements that I part the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal set as well. Um, in terms of the, the retailing part of our business, there are a lot of um, compliance measures and regulation that, um, that we are guided by. And so there's, there's quarterly um, reporting that we provide to a whole range of government agencies, um, federally and state, um, that is essentially are the, the checks and measures to, to ensure that we are um, signing up customers and delivering um, accurate bills to customers. Um, so, so pretty normal systems and processes. Yes. I mean, how yes. apart from trusting that all these shareholders really get a sense yes. of um, you're doing a fantastic job. Okay. So the other thing sure. I wanted to say that underpinning all of what Felicity's been talking about is is the culture. Um, it's absolutely critical, and it's from from right through that we are about transparency. We share information with our customers. So we don't hide anything. We try to have as transparent a process on our billing bills. And um, we don't, unlike um, if, if we uh, offer a, a price, then we won't change that without advising them. And unlike some um, retailers, we would never just let people slide back onto a higher rate. Um, simply True. because, you know, and which is the way that a lot operate. And, and it's uh, transparency has been a driving force in the way that we've established ourselves. As far as how the shareholders get to know, well, they get a um, pretty close to a monthly newsletter from me um, with a report on how we're going. And then people uh, are invited to uh, meetings. We just had a special general meeting last night um, to look at the constitutional issues that would be tied up with the, um, sh the capital raise. Um, 
and people get a chance to ask questions. So yes, they have a very right. direct they have a very direct relationship with the board, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a very, a very highly active customer base, which is fantastic because it's constantly bringing us feedback. Um, we have our financial accounts that are audited regularly as well, so there's transparency on all our financials. Um, but we, we literally have people clamouring to, to work, to come and work at Innova, which is unlike businesses that I've worked in before that are often for profit. And that's why, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's great that Innova is, is for purpose and a social enterprise um, and really looking to, to change the dial on community engagement and giving back um, to the community. So it's great. We have a whole range of interns and other team members that have really been wanting to work at Innova for a long time. So it's the internal culture that's driven, um, you know, from the top down really, from our chair, Alison, and, and board um, that are highly passionate about Innova and, and what, we're, what we're doing. Brilliant. But let's move on to talk about crowdfunding platforms because a lot of us in the community energy space and probably need to understand how how well they work and and why did you choose this particular one? How many did you check out? You know that that what were your options? Um, we'd all love to know a little bit more. Yeah, I I think at this point it's it's safe to say that we're we're all learning. Um, we actually went into this um, quite rapidly. Um, and we decided to partner with um, an organisation that was recommended. Um, so we, we had a look at what they were offering and we thought that um, it would work for us. And this is, it needs to be remembered, this is equity crowdfunding. There's a very, there's not such a huge number of platforms around mm -hmm. at all. They have to be have to have been given the tick, the go ahead by um, by the uh, regulator by the, by ASIC. Um, so um, there's a lot of requirements on them. Uh, we we chose Crowd eighty eight and and partly because they also had a, a, a good group of investors that they'd been building up um, that that we could go straight that they could go straight to. Um, so they'd been while they'd been waiting for their license, um, they had been building up um, people who may be interested in investing, um, and so that was that was one of the reasons that we chose them. Um, I think perhaps it's probably best to say that we're all learning, um, and that we're very happy to share our learnings with others. Um, as, as we go down go down the path um, rather than um, talking too much about it at this point we're requesting some changes to the website to make it easier to use and we're finding that our communities um, do struggle with some of the requirements so interesting um, yeah and we've we've put together a little list that we can send out to anybody um, we're asking them to come up with a little, potentially a, a video that might be used for people, just to think about some ways in which we can make it easier to use the website. But there are a lot of requirements there. So maybe I'll make a promise now that um, any of the resources and stuff that we uh, pick up today, we might try and um, put in uh, a link uh, somewhere for people to go and look at afterwards. and. Um, we're putting this on Facebook, so I'll put the link in there and I will be emailing everyone who's attended today with the updated uh, video and stuff like that. So um, there's a few more questions here uh, as, as we move through. Um, options for lease to own schemes in community buy-in projects. Have you, have you looked at any lease to own? I know you've looked at low income and how to support them with having their own rooftop solar. Is this an option? So if I give the example, in the UK, they have a lot of um, rent and buy type things on houses yeah. where, you know, your rent starts to go to pay off your mortgage as well and, and you're in, in between being a renter and, a, sure. and, and an owner. And yeah. obviously these, these sort of models be stable enough to, to fully um, uh, buy sure. something forever. 
Yeah, we, we don't have the finances to actually do the financing and that's where partnering with a group, for example, like local government who might be able to do things with their rates. Mm -hmm. I guess this is the models that we've looked at or that we're looking at and intend to implement first are things like our solar garden for renters mm -hmm. so that people who are renting or can't have solar on their roof can purchase panels um, in a, a, a solar garden that, that for us will be on the roof of a business. Mm -hmm. Um, and our virtual power plant uh, is the other one that we're working on where um, we would put the solar and battery on the roof and the person underneath does not have to pay for anything um, but they, and they get a discount but we get the opportunity to make use of the um, stored energy when, at peak times and so on. Um, so And at the end of a 15-year period they would own what is there which means that they'd, they'd have the, the panels which would go on being useful at any rate and probably an inverter that will continue to go for some time. But um, Your virtual power plant's a trial. Is, is, did you get funding for that or um, did, did you get any grants or anything? For the virtual? We haven't got any... Virtual power plant. So we, we, and in fact, we've just parked that for the time being because we're busy getting our first solar garden working and our first microgrid. The microgrid, we got some money from government, New South Wales government, um, just for the marketing. Of it, of the concept to to the um, to the arts and industry estate. Um, so, and it was only a small amount of funding. But we're also working closely with our distributor, Essential, um, uh, and they will be putting some funds into it themselves. Yes, and looking at a, a grid size. We've got a couple more. Got a couple more questions coming in here. Um, do you have any intention of seeking a Victorian retail license? Absolutely, um, but it's a timing thing. So if there, are, if there are a group who'd like to work with us, we'd like to work with them and that would make it more feasible. So um, we are talking, we're talking with one group at the moment that might make it mean that we would need to be do, going down that path early next year. Fantastic. Um, and Susan's also asked, uh, I'd like to know more about the mention of local governments in Victoria seeking to become retailers who wear contacts. Susan, um, I've got a little paper that we did on a whole lot of retail models uh, for our work in South Australia, and I'm, I think I've got permission to publish it. Um, so I'm going to try and do a link, uh, but it's, it's something like the Northern, uh, Northern Alliance of Greenhouse Councils or something like that, um, and uh, we will, someone, Manny might, still be on his, but uh, he might be able to give you the exact uh, details there. So, um, is there any... I can't see who, who the participants are, but is there anyone from Tribe? Because they've certainly been working on uh, working with others to provide regional self-sufficiency, but I didn't think they were, I mean, and they've looked at and had funding to look into their own building their own retailer, but I didn't think they were actually going to form one so much yes, as partner, and partner with one. That whole Wodonga, Wangaratta region has been quite active as well and I I had the impression that the um, project had uh, come up there. Well, um, yes, as far as so I know, they're working, they're working with the tribe people, but we're also working with the Albury Wodonga people as well. So there's... Whole <laughs> right, David's come back. Naga, N-A-G-A. David, you'll have to tell us what that stands for. It uh, might be Northern Alliance of Greenhouse something or other, but um, we did the report, happy to talk. So, and, and David, we might need to get you to have a webinar at some stage. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask one last question uh, that's a bit of a juicy one, and we're going to try and finish up um, bang on 7 o'clock. But it's more of a chat. What are the barriers to community energy proliferation in Australia? What are the barriers in other parts of the world, particularly in developing countries? So, um, what, do, what did, as we get philosophical at the end of our webinar, guys, what do you think? Well, the, the, one of the barriers to community energy proliferation to date has been that uh, Whenever a community thinks about having an energy farm, a solar farm of any sort, that's not behind the metre, they run into the costs of distribution. Um, and 
it's just very, very, very hard to make it stack up. And that's been one of, of the big barriers for so many groups that have almost got there. Um, we're hoping that as we grow uh, and with a few, and as technology changes and with a few different ways of thinking about things, we can, we can make some of those work. Um, we would very much like to be part of doing some in front of the meter rather than behind the meter, um, community um, generation plants. But so far, uh, and ARENA, we're part of, a, we're part of a, uh, an ARENA pilot that's looking at those and testing out all of the models. Um, and that's one that's got uh, a branch in Victoria, a branch in Sydney and a branch up here in terms of looking at, at that pilot. Um, so that's just one of the big barriers. So there's obviously regulatory barriers, there's, there's um, and there's the cost barriers. Uh, and of course... And I'll give a shameless plug for my Churchill Fellowship. So yes, exactly. many of us now from the community energy sector Um, and, and I will put up the links for these later on. I, I've done one, I looked at community energy and um, Chris Cooper also did one. He looked much more at the solar innovation. Mm. Uh, Karen looked at 100% renewable energy community. Now, um, one of the reflections I would have is how much of it's cultural and uh, artificially created by government and the way they interact with the energy market. Yes, so an awful lot yeah. of other places haven't incentivised rooftop solar, haven't incentivised the individual, but they have, um, it, by, by doing it the, the way they've done it, they've incentivised sort of middle-sized solar. And mm -hmm. so communities, uh, because they're not empowered to do rooftop solar, are getting together and doing um, community scale solar. You see an awful lot of that in Cornwall in the UK. So it's, it's really interesting how culture plays into um, the culture of a place and how you construct things. I've had a long whinge for a long time that um, New South Wales and Victoria appear to be ahead of the other states because the government's decided um, sending some putting some incentives out to the regions to do community energy was quite a good idea. And in South Australia, we were all very complacent because we had high penetration of renewables. So it was really hard for me to get a conversation here about, well, why doesn't government support the smaller scale community level stuff? Mm. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's the shape of the market too that we have in Australia. I mean, it's, quite different in places like, like Germany and, and America, where, where you've just got, you haven't got um, the, the generators and the retailers being one and the same. You know, we started off by allowing an integrated um, uh, oligopoly to, to remain when they set up the market. So uh, yeah. that's been a big deterrent to just about everything in the community energy field. And they keep the pressure yeah, on the, and the lobbying on government and, and away it goes. Uh, but I agree with you about um, the, the whole, I think there's a real, there is a real need for us to, to talk more about community ownership as opposed to individual. And that's where things like DC Power worry me a bit because it's about rewarding the people who've already got solar as opposed to bringing the community together to think about how everybody can have solar. Yep, yep, definitely. So I'm going to wind us up. I'm going to thank you very much, uh, Alison. Thank you so much, Felicity. Matt, who's behind the scenes um, catching some of those questions and, and working out what the answers were. Uh, and we will publish all of that. And of course, most of all, um, today, we'd love some feedback. I'll be sending you an email. And um, yes, I'm. Last words to you, to you two, and then I'll, I'll um, wind us up. Oh, thanks very much, Heather and C for CE in setting this up and making it all happen. It's just been tremendous. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, please, people, um, if you have any questions, come either directly to us to ask questions or have a look at the, if you think you're interested, um, we're very happy to send you more information about the capital raise but we'd love to see your communities owning a chunk of Innova. 
Absolutely. And look, thanks for the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Um, the conversation around communities and community energy is, is vital for, for all of our future. So thank you. Thanks. So thank you all. I'm going to press stop and uh, say goodbye to everyone.